of the spicy life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Madi, and today's episode is how we got pregnant. I want to share with you guys and be vulnerable the process that my husband and I had for getting uh, into this beautiful place of love in my belly. And uh, joining me on the episode today is my amazing husband, Shay, uh, also known as Smart Jamaican. <laughs> So I love when he joins me because I always put him like in this spotlight that he loves me behind the scenes. Um, he is always helping me with the spicy life and of course helping me run my company. But he is a great asset and we really do see ourselves as a team. So I wanted to share with you guys more insight into like what it took to get pregnant. This is not really a biology episode of like how we made the baby. It's more of like the steps that we took and what we learned. So I'm going to share a few things with you today. I'm going to go through um, health. I want to cover fears that I had, um, how we got pregnant, and then some family planning that we had to do. So um, when it comes to the decision to have a baby, um, I was procrastinating for a long time. Um, I come from a single parent home where uh, you guys have heard my story before. Mother has been married multiple times and there was fears around um, if that would happen to me. If, you know, me understanding that I am a relationship expert and what the necessary steps were, applying SPICY to everything in my life, even when it came to, you know, me meeting my husband, dating, of course, what I do for my clients, but also when it came to, you know, now family planning, um, who am I, what do I want, and what do I have to offer this world? Like, that's the S. Um, what, what do I have to offer a child? What passions do I have to give them? Um, what kind of relationship am I going to have with this child? That's intimacy. Um, how am I going to communicate, you know, everything that I have learned and teach them everything. And then, um, that's communication. And then yes is, you know, what are my, you know, fears or the new beliefs that aren't serving me and can I overcome these? Um, you always, I felt like knew you wanted to be a parent. You were ready for that. Um, I felt like yes no. okay, so <laughs> okay, so so elaborate on that. So, I I would say I procrastinated not because out of fear, but mm -hmm. my dad taught me don't rush into having kids. He always taught me that lesson. He said, make sure you you live your life, and not live your life in the sense of going out there and just you know, sowing your royal oaks or whatever. More so fulfilling certain things and meeting certain goals so that you have the right foundation to to establish and, and start a family. So he told me not to rush into to marriage and not to rush into starting a family. And um, I don't know if it was, yeah, I would say so. It was basically him saying, don't do what I did to a certain extent. Um, you know, and I don't think my dad has any regrets about any of you know, his children. I just think that he was, you know, just like every other generation before him, um, giving words of wisdom. And, and I took that to heart. Don't rush into marriage. Make sure you have the right foundation. Uh, make sure you find the right person. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that I procrastinated. I, I just was a little bit more strategic about my choices and the decision to start a family. Um, that, that sounded well, I, better than it, than it. I appreciated your leadership, though, because your strategicness and your confidence definitely helped me with mine. I am blessed to be with a partner who is an amazing leader and protector and provider. So uh, the security was there. That was established. But for me, I still had limiting beliefs. My fears around like my upbringing, being the oldest of three, and seeing some tumultuous relationships and decisions that my mom had made. Um, now being educated, understanding um, how to have a healthy family and how to create a healthy relationship, of course I'm gonna apply those and have been, but I had so much responsibility at a young age taking care of my siblings and then also, so I was like not in any rush and then also um, hadn't reached a place in my career yet where I felt financially um, like I was capable of bringing this human life into this world. Uh, we grew up very poor. And so there was also some scarcity mindset around being ready for the kid. 
And so I, <laughs> it's already expensive. And I waited a very long time. I'm like, no, there's these numbers that I want to hit. Now that doesn't happen for everyone. Not everybody can, you know, base it off of, you know, trying to reach certain goals. For me, I prolonged the, the, the pregnancy as long as possible, making sure like, okay, healthy relationship check, husband who, you know, is a partner check, um, love, safety, security check. And then also, you know, the spicy life was my baby before my actual baby and making sure that the company was in a good place for me to be able to have a certain amount of clients, um, you know, and be able to focus then from, you know, the spicy life being able to run to now, can I run, you know, a household of my own? So um, how I got over those fears, uh, <laughs> talking with you. Having, you know, strong and healthy communication about those. You calling me out oftentimes on some of them. Um, but then there was also fears around my health, my age, because I had waited till I would reach a certain level of success or had the relationship that I wanted. Um, my age played a role in addition to the finances and in addition to um, my health. So that's another thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about that I've mentioned on the show before. Um, early on in my 20s, I was diagnosed with PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, where there's a hormonal imbalance that can sometimes have too much testosterone or an imbalance of estrogen and testosterone in your body and it can make it harder for you to get pregnant so now you know we're talking and i'm like okay i think i'm ready i think um covid really put me in this place of i'm building this legacy i'm doing all of these things i'm procrastinating and what am i doing it all for <laughs> if i have no one to leave it to um and i want to create amazing incredible little babies that have the love that we have to give the world um and teach them the healthy relationship tools that i've learned that we've shared uh i really wanted to put my superior little human on earth to like change the world i know you laugh at me all the time when i say that but a whole lot of expectations <laughs> i know right <laughs> But um, we made the decision together, and that's, I think, when, like, some of the nerves started to creep in. Like, oh, my gosh, what if this is going to be challenging for me? Um, I've heard a lot of stories about how hard it is to get pregnant. And so there's all these concerns about now getting pregnant, especially even with the PCOS. But what I did was a lot of prayer. I did a lot of meditation. Um, I had a lot of conversations just on my own with just, like, God. Like, separate from my husband, but just, like, God. Um... I want this and I'm ready. And if you see fit, bless me with this baby. And so the health scares that I thought were going to happen from the PCOS, um, I decided that I was going to take action because I'm a firm believer in like asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knock on the door will be open. That's my favorite scripture. Um, I live and breathe it, especially when it comes to like my coaching and matchmaking. Now I had to apply it when it came to my own health for having this baby. So knowing the side effects of like PCOS can be like weight gain or extreme um, hairiness or, um, you know, the hardship sometimes that comes with getting pregnant. I decided to take my health into my own hands and I went on a strict diet so that I could lose weight in preparation for the baby to make sure because um, obesity also is a side effect of PCOS and obesity also runs in my family. So uh, had a personal trainer help train me, uh, put me on a strict diet. And I gave up alcohol. That one was really hard for me. <laughs> yeah, it was. Because <laughs> I love my tequila. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually don't discriminate. I actually like all alcohol, but um, tequila is my favorite. Gave up tequila. And um, then four months go by. And we still hadn't gotten pregnant. My girlfriend on the last month had given me the Mira Fertility app and this Mira egg. She gets pregnant on it, um, shout out to Roxanne, and she sends it to me. I use the Mirror app and clock my ovulation to a T because the over-the-counter sticks weren't doing, it wasn't doing it. And you're looking at me like, why are we now using <laughs> this like little egg technology? Yeah. Um, but I'm it was like- on the fourth month. It was on the fourth month. Fourth. On the fourth month. Uh, this was in December and you were with it though. You were like, okay, whatever makes my wife feel comfortable, makes her feel like she's doing something, um, taking matters into her own hands. Uh, the fourth month, it hit and we got pregnant. 
Um, I even read like the gender book on um, how to have like the gender that you want. Um, and yeah, I really wanted a boy. I don't think that that, I'll let her finish. <laughs> He has his doubts about the science. I'll let, let her tell her the theory, and then I'll, I'll debunk the theory. Okay, the theory with <laughs> the um, baby book on how to have, like, the gender baby that you want is that you are supposed to have sex at the end of your ovulation if you want a boy, at the beginning if you want a girl. The theory is that the boys swim stronger, but that the girls survive longer. So you want to have sex at the end of your ovulation. We did that, and we also followed... The mirror app to make sure that my peak ovulation um, for my LH levels were like at its highest. So the moment that it hit a 10, we did it. Now, mind you, a few days before that, we did it also, but it was still at the end of my ovulation. I got my boy. So I have a simpler theory. My dad has three boys. My grandfather has five. So I think boys run in the family. <laughs> Genetics do play a, a part in you getting the gender that you want as well or in what gender comes out. Um, so yes, uh, you get the credit. I would like to think <laughs> that science also played a role in helping us. Um, it's scientific. Genetics and science. <laughs> uh, but that, High likelihood. Yes, but like I like to think like the planning helped. Or at least it brought comfort to me in knowing I was doing something in order to manifest what I want. Um, oftentimes I will tell my clients like, you know, it's not enough to just say that you want these things. What are the behaviors that you're doing behind it to support that, but also prove to the universe that you're really serious about these things. So for me, I needed to take action. I needed to have some type of involvement. And when we got our boy, um, happiest moment probably, like this entire pregnancy was like finding out, yes, like we did it. In addition to the fact that, of course, the moment that we found out we were pregnant, we were in Hawaii on vacation, um, everything was shut down, it was COVID. And like that was us in Hawaii. My New Year's, my trainer had told me, shout out to Ingrid, um, my trainer had told me that I could have alcohol <laughs> um, just in celebration. And you wouldn't let me drink. You were like, nope, we've been trying to get pregnant. You need to go take a test first. <laughs> because you, 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 I you wanted missed to know. Your, it's been like almost, you missed your cycle. Like two weeks. Two weeks late. More than two weeks. I feel like it was two weeks late. It was longer than two weeks. I felt like I should have still had to drink. But he was like, let's go to CVS and get a pregnancy test. Um, so still didn't get to drink. <laughs> I was not a month late. You were. Still didn't get to drink um, because... Right, it was the November cycle, so you're almost a month in. You're over a month. But the ovulation was in December. That's why they clocked it from your last period, which was in November. That's why the timeline, you're like, why did they... And that's another thing, when they go in to tell you how, how um, old the fetus is, they use from your last, the end of your last cycle, and that was November. Okay. Um, this is, this is he has years. a better memory than I do, so... Yeah. I'm going to give this to him. Um, <laughs> that, that's how it works. So this is an educational podcast as well. Okay, so and I will, they, I will give this to, to him. determine the age of the fetus they use from the end of your, your previous cycle. Or actually the beginning of your last cycle is the date that they use. Not the date that you got pregnant. Notice how headstrong my husband is. So when he makes a point, I... Try my hardest to submit and fall back uh, instead of arguing. Uh, <laughs> I I was actually this taken aback when right they here. told me that. They told me that, and I was like, "That doesn't make any sense." Everyone goes, "That doesn't make any sense," and it doesn't. But that's a date that they can have. That's true. They can guesstimate when you actually got pregnant, but scientifically, they don't want to guesstimate, so they know more precisely when your last cycle was, and they used your last cycle. As the date, and I know that for a fact that it was November. Well, regardless of the date, <laughs> I'm I felt very excited the day that we found out that we were pregnant. But I think even more excited when I found out that it was also the gender that I wanted. Um, there, because all of this, all of these things that I was doing in preparation, like with my body, just health, everything, um, and releasing the fear of the PCOS and the fear of like age and just being like, God, if it's in your will. Um, and as of course, consistently having sex, that's a great way to get pregnant. Um, but you also want to make sure that it's during your ovulation because you can only get pregnant a few days out of the month. 
which most people don't know. So instead of just, you know, and mind you, you want to have, you know, a healthy appetite, but you also want to make sure you're like doing it at the appropriate times when it's your peak ovulation. So putting all of this like mindfulness into action and then being able to manifest our child and then also being the gender, super excited. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about some of the other concerns that I had, which was, you know, what kind of parent am I gonna be? Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to, of course, each generation wants to be a better parent than your parents. And mind you, my mother was amazing with like all the things that I share with you about my family or, you know, um, my fathers or, you know, my husband. I reveal a lot to you guys on these episodes. I was still concerned like, dang, am I going to be a, a great parent? And if so, I need these tools, I need these resources. So, of course, I started reading all of the books. Um, what to expect when expecting but prior to that before we even started family planning because I wanted to do some breaking of the generational curses um, I made my husband and I read the conscious parent because I wanted us to be conscious parents um, I wanted us to do different tools and tactics when it comes to raising your child in 2021 than my mom had done for us in the 80s so read that and then it was such a great book I had a conversation with you you thought I was crazy once again and was like the whole family <laughs> should read this <laughs> I want all of our siblings to read this um I want all of you know our aunts and uncles and our parents to read this as well so I approached you about us reading the book and then also having a book club because at that time during COVID like we couldn't see anyone so I was like let's just everybody hop on zoom and we discuss from the elders what they learn from the book, what they will do differently as grandparents um, and aunts and uncles in the rearing of our child or the upbringing and rising of our child and how we felt about what we learned from the book and what we plan on implementing so that we could all be on the same page. Um, got the family together. They all read the book. I sent it to everybody. <laughs> And then we literally got on a Zoom call and talked and discussed. Not just the elders either. It was our siblings, siblings as well. As yeah, well. the aunts and uncles of um, our baby and had a huge discussion around. They have no idea. <laughs> <child makes>. <laughs> <laughs> well, our and siblings? They, they were there for more of a support sort of saying, hey, we're, we're part of the support network. Um, you know, babysitters, you have you. Our siblings uh, haven't had kids yet, but our parents were able to contribute. They, they um, and so were our aunts and uncles. They definitely contributed. I mean, they're <laughs> high, you know, uh, level of opinions were on that call. Yes. It was definitely an opinionated call. Um, a little debate on, like, did this work? Did it not work? You know, um, our family tried to come in it uh, as an undefensive is that a word indefensive indefensive, indefensive. <laughs> as possible because we also didn't want it to come off as if it was an attack on the elders on like how they raised us because they did a great job i mean for all of the challenges and their level of consciousness at that time period we came out really great but we wanted to take it up a step for our kids and that, and i was huge on that i was like things will be different um i'll give you an example that i speak to like discipline um growing up I was extremely disciplined. Um, to, in 2021, they would call it abuse. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, so sorry, mom, I gotta put, gotta put you out there. Um, Nina, gotta put you out there. Um, but we're going to have different policies around that. We, want our, we wanted our parents to be on the same page with that, aunts and uncles to be on the same page with that, on like how we're gonna discipline our child. And you know, the book speaks to that. So it, it drove you know some great conversation around and that. And that. That's a good point because far too too often, especially in our culture, the parents drive the disciplinary type of actions. They try to teach you how to discipline your children. Um, we beg to differ. Um, I think we should, as time goes on, um, methods and tactics, they, they change, they evolve. We become more knowledgeable. Um, we should determine how our kids are, are disciplined. Um, and that's something that's, you know, not easily accepted in our community. Yep. Um, but I think it's something that we need to stand up for. We need to be actively involved in every aspect of our child. Um, and there is nothing that happens with a child that our, that our parents should be driving. We should be the driving force behind all of that. 
we take their advice, we take the knowledge they've, they've raised us, um, but at the end of the day, they're our children. Um, you know, they say it takes a community to raise the children. It absolutely does. You learn from your, your, your elders, um, but they did their turn. They raised us. It's no longer their turn. Tap out. It's our turn. <laughs> they don't drive any aspects of how we're raising our children. Um, and so that's one thing that I'm very adamant on. Um, I love my mother to death. I love my father to death. I love your mother, your father to death. But they don't need to tell me how I need to raise my kids. Well, I think, so I'm going to beg to differ a little bit on that. I think that sometimes subconsciously, we don't even know things that are coming up for us that come from our parents. If I'm doing something wrong, someone should call me out on that. No, I'm saying there's things that we carry over from our upbringing that we are already pro programmed, that we have been exposed to from an environment that we grew up in, that we will naturally do. They may not be able to tell us that we're doing it because there, there are the reasons why we're doing those things. Right. And all I'm saying is that even, even if our parents are not telling us, hey, that's wrong or hey, that's right, we still may be carrying on their practices. Mm -hmm. And this is why I wanted the Conscious Parent book to lead um, some of our discussion with our family was because whether you're saying, you know, they're going to have a huge hand in it or not, or we're taking on, you know, their rules or their regulations or the way that they brought us up, there's still things that I know that I even see myself doing even while I'm pregnant that I'm like, oh my God, I'm acting like my mom or I'm responding like my mom or my dad in this situation. I think Absolutely. that carries on, you know, subconsciously, you don't even know. It shouldn't. They, they should tell, and what I'm, what I'm saying is, we should not expect, we, we take the responsibility to make this child, and we take the leadership on that responsibility in raising that child. Your elders aren't the ones that are determining or dictating how you should raise your child, and far too often, that seems to be the case. So what happens is, we, to your point, we continue these bad habits and these legacies. We need to take that responsibility, and that's something you did up front, is understanding what, what cultural norms, and yes, cultural norms are important. A lot of us like to think that, I don't care what society does, mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. We can't do that. Our kids need to, so, they need to socialize with other kids. And I'm not saying that other parents do things correctly, but we need to understand the environment that our kids are going into we understand the social norms within the environment that we live, and we take that into consideration when we're determining our plan, our action plans for raising our children. Um, but that's absolutely our responsibility to take leadership on. We can take advice. Think of it as a board of directors. We're the chairman of the board. We have a lot of directors around <laughs> at the end of the day, though, um, and, and, and probably a bad analogy because they can vote us out. <laughs> But imagine that these are, there's a three-member board. We've got two votes. No one's going to vote us out. <laughs> this is true, which is why we have to be on the same page. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions on how we're going to, you know, of course, raise this child, what we're going to um, teach him. But also, I think one of the huge reasons why I wanted us to get together collectively as a family and really read The Conscious Parent, but also have that family discussion before he was born before we even like even started trying was because um, a huge part of I think what also embodies us that you mentioned earlier was like culture. Um, I am proud and love that I am black and Mexican. I live, breathe and eat both of my cultures. I'm proud of both of them. Both of them are beautiful. Both of them um, merged to come together to create the huge family that I have. And it was it's very important to me that my child understand his black and Mexican roots and you also come from um he, my, our child will also be coming from um and he'll be first generation on your side because you came from Jamaica super proud of his Jamaican culture his entire family is like Jamaican all day representing and we're merging you know my black and Mexican with his Jamaican culture and it's important that our son know all three of his cultures um, yes, Jamaicans are black, however, they are Caribbean and will remind you of that 24 seven, that they are not American and that they think different, they feel different, they respond different, um, they believe different. Um, you came to the U.S. when you were 14? Yeah, teenager. So it really impacted him. 
um, a, a huge amount in his like upbringing and who he is, you know, who he sees himself and his image and himself as a man. And, you know, I'm excited that my child is going to have a lot of those, you know, roots and that strong, you know, heritage to, you know, drive from and to pull from. But I also want him to know, like, my roots that my grandfather you know was a, a sharecropper and his father was a slave and you know freed at 15 and you know i want him to know about my mexican side that came from sonora and you know how they were you know um yaki also yaki tribe you know our indian roots like a huge on just all of the you know culture and love that we have to offer him but him to take pride in that and I think that that was important to you too. So it was great to have like a family discussion about how our cultures have impacted our upbringing um, and where, you know, where our mindset is on like, you know, well, this is how we, you know, raised our child with Jamaican culture and, you know, my family able to contribute. Well, this is, you know, how we merged, you know, black and Mexican. I say all this to say like having these open discussions and being able to pour all of this, you know, love that we have to offer into our child we're extremely excited about but in no mean shape or form has it been you know perfect even from like you know the planning or making the decision of having the baby to like getting pregnant to you know discussing it with our family um but what has been great is having a partner who is a great communicator um great leader and who is able to understand and manage sometimes my emotions my feelings and being able to like bring me back down to earth and calm me down when there's fears or concerns like popping this baby out. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I just want to emphasize to you guys like it's more than just the like planning of the pregnancy. You want to make sure that you have you know a great partner too who really understands and like who is just as excited as you are to have this child but also has the logic um, to be able to balance you out and of course his like we did an episode before on um, how an alpha woman oh, attracts man. an alpha man um, so I love my alpha man um, and how he's able to you know really settle my nerves sometimes and really input that like logic when it's hard work <laughs> I feel like you do a great job of like managing us um, but it's a team effort. It is. And I oftentimes will turn to you. And when I make decisions or, um, for any of the family planning, like I'm turning to you, asking you, how do you feel about this? What do you think? What's your opinion? Sometimes I don't ask and you insert it anyways. So it always reminds me <laughs> to make sure that I do, but we just kind of wanted to share with you what our journey was in this pregnancy. Cause now I'm currently eight months. Um, his name is Almost here. Yeah, he's almost here. Baby Princeton uh, is the name. And uh, Baby Princeton uh, has two parents who love him incredibly. And just kind of wanted to share with you guys, because I love you guys as well, and wanted to give you some insight on, like, how this has been for us thus far and how we got to this place. Um, and letting you know that when you're ready to start your family, um, fears are natural, concerns are natural. But the most important thing is, like, having that open communication and sharing with your partner, you know, how you feel about it and what's going on and allowing your guys, you know, opportunity to have open dialogue about best practices and that family planning portion. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you guys for joining us on this episode of how we got pregnant with Princeton. Uh, you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my IG at spicy Mari. Go to the spicy life.com. Click and subscribe, schedule a consultation. I also have a fabulous spicy e-course that's workshop style with a community of amazing women who are experiencing challenges, um, and that are going to be very relatable to you. So if you are ready to meet your purpose mate and raise your vibration, uh, make sure that you look up the spicy e-course and register right now. Offer code get spicy 500. Uh, but you can also follow Smart Jamaican at Smart Jamaican. And we also created an IG handle for Princeton. And his IG is Princeton Shay. So make sure that you guys also follow our baby and our baby adventures uh, that are going to be going down. But there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.